Once again, welcome back and uh, happy Thanksgiving if you're on the Canadian side of the 49th parallel and uh, welcome to uh, Bay Community Church Virtual at this particular point in time. And we uh, pray that uh, God will grant you a time to uh, make this a meaningful uh, word for this morning and um, let's open up in a word of prayer so that we could uh, take part in the service as it stands. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, for the season of Thanksgiving. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, for all the things that we have received from your hand this year and beyond. It's been a difficult and challenging year, O oh Lord, but we pray that you turn that into uh, our discipline and our good and our favor. And we pray too, O oh Lord, for the church, wherever she gathers at this particular point, that she might be grateful as well. We ask your blessing upon this time. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be present in the midst of the viewers in the midst of this time that we do spend together in the sanctuary. And we give you um, great thanks and praise for the country that is Canada, uh, for the bounty that you've shown this year in the, in the fall and for the harvest. And we thank you, O oh God, for all these good gifts, especially the gift of your son, uh, who is really the uh, opening door for all that remains in eternity, which is plenty. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, I'm going to introduce Michael Lopianowski, uh, my friend to read the scriptures. Mike. We have three readings today, beginning in the Psalms. The first reading, Psalm 118, 1 to 19. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. O oh, let Israel say, his loving kindness is everlasting. O oh, let the house of Aaron say, his loving kindness is everlasting. O oh, let those who fear the Lord say, His loving kindness is everlasting. For my distress I call from my distress I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is for me, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me, therefore I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me, yes, they surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They were extinguished as a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. You pushed me violently so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. The sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I will not die, but live and tell of the works of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open the gates of righteousness. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. Second reading is from 2 Samuel 19, verses 1 to 8a. Then it was told Joab, Behold, the king is weeping and mourns for Absalom. The victory that day was turned to mourning for all the people, for the people heard it said that day, the king is grieved for his son. So the people went by stealth into the city that day, as people who are humiliated steal away when, the, when they flee in battle. The king covered his face and cried out with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son, then Joab came into the house of the king and said, Today you have covered with shame the face of all your servants, who today have saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives, and the lives of your concubines, by loving those who hate you and by hating those who love you. 
For you have shown today that princes and servants are nothing to you. I know this, for I know this day that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then you would be pleased. Now therefore, arise, go out, and speak kindly to your servants, for I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, surely not a man will pass the night with you, and this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth until now. So the king arose and sat in the gate, when they told all the people, saying, Behold, the king is sitting at the gate. Then all the people came before the king. The last reading is from Ecclesiastics, chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is prevalent among men, a man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God has empowered him to eat from them, for a foreigner enjoys them. Correction. Yet God has not empowered him to eat from them, for a foreigner enjoys them. This is vanity, a severe affliction. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, however many they may be, but his soul is not satisfied with the good things, and he does not even have a proper burial, then I say, better the miscarriage than he. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. Once again, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we've heard a number of uh, different readings today, and uh, hopefully we can try to begin to put them together and get a sense of what the theme will be for today, because, of course, we wanted to be focused somewhat on the Thanksgiving topic, and I think this is another way to do it. I think... It's something uh, that we can take a look at, and I've entitled this particular sermon, The Failure to Be Grateful, because in some respects, um, that's a challenge for a lot of us, a lot of us who actually sit in the midst and stand in the midst of great bounty and, and great, uh, great material things in some respects, uh, and yet in some way fail to be acknowledging with gratitude um, what actually has come our way by grace. It's a challenge to us all in our particular context, so let's talk about this a little bit more. But first I'm going to actually back up a little bit because I'm going to give you a bit of a background with respect to Absalom. And we read a little bit about him today after his death and the impact that that had upon his father. But I want to actually uh, just pull something right away from the 15th chapter of the second book of Samuel and read this particular element that will give you a sense of uh, Absalom's uh, dubious character in some respects. And this says this in 2 Samuel, beginning at 15, verse 2. And Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when any man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, Your claims are good and right, but there is no man designated by the king to hear you. Then Absalom would say, Oh, that I were judge in the land. Then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me, and I would give him justice. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. The scriptures make it perfectly plain, uh, perfectly clear, exactly, that um, if you read Absalom's career as it goes, uh, that he has a lot going for him. Absalom, one of King David's sons, is, among other things, a good-looking guy. Scripture says from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, he was pretty much the perfect specimen. He was without blemish, as it says in the Scriptures. And we might say that in the contemporary vernacular, he was everything that perhaps a monarch should look like if you had to picture that. Absalom's hair itself was thick, curly, and awesome, you could say. 
and charm? Well, yes, Absalom could absolutely turn on that switch too. He had a lot going for him. But in some of his talents and skills and gifts, therein lay the problem. Because you know what? As he grew up, what Absalom wanted, Absalom tended to get. Behind all those dashing good looks and good locks, Absalom became a masterful political manipulator. And it wasn't long before Absalom set his eyes on the ultimate prize, nothing less than the royal crown of Israel. The biggest problem for Absalom at that particular point was, dear old dad wasn't done wearing the crown yet. Yet to Absalom that appears to have been but a minor detail. I'll be brief in a little bit of this fascinating backstory, but suffice it to say, Absalom had lots going for him, and he had actually an additional gift, you might say. He was remarkably patient. He wasn't looking for the crown of Israel at the end of the month or at the end of the year. He took his time, and he slowly, deliberately plotted a takeover of the Israelite monarchy. He plotted what we would call a coup d'etat. After about four years of playing judge, theatrically we may add, may add, at the gate of Jerusalem, as you just heard, he had succeeded in building up, uh, up enough social capital, we might say, that he was made ready to make his move. He had, as the scriptures say, stolen the hearts of the people. And it was at that point that he made his move. And so it was that in the city of Hebron, south of Jerusalem, he got his growing group of supporters to declare him king over all Israel. Well, as soon as King David heard from his messenger that the hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom, he knew what that meant. He grasped the political implications. Now, he loved his son. But he told all his servants, nonetheless, that they must flee Jerusalem, the capital city, lest Absalom bring down ruin upon them and upon the city itself. And this sets up for a dramatic moment, a number of dramatic moments. We see David's hasty retreat from the city with what remains of his army and counselors and family. And we see in that retreat that even David's ba like favorite counselor, his best counselor in all the kingdom, a man who is hardly ever wrong, a man by the name of Ahith Ahithophel, had joined the ranks of Absalom's conspirators. And so David basically plants in his retreat a strategic prayer. And he says this, O Lord, please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. It says that in 2 Samuel 15, 31. A strategic prayer in retreat given up to God. And as it turns out, God made that counselor appear wrong as a result. Second thing that was interesting to note about that retreat was that David left a friend behind strategically, Hushai. Uh, and he left him in there as an inside agent, you might say to give David a, a lot of insider information. He also uh, gave him a task to try to see if he could defeat the council of, it, of Atithapel and thereby supply rest to David's, needed, uh, to, uh, David's weary army in retreat. To, to in some ways effect change within the court of Absalom so that Absalom would be delayed in his attack. Well, that is, interestingly enough, also successful. When Absalom is finally ready to lead in battle, in terms of the third point here, David's generals are themselves more than ready as well. And their experience in battle, being among them David's mighty men, pays off. David's commanders and David's soldiers defeat Absalom's army, with Absalom being caught by his hair and left to dangle in the forest of Ephraim. And at this point, David's most successful general, arguably, Joab, had had enough of rebellion. 
And when he finds Absalom dangling live from the tree, he kills him with a javelin, even though David had asked for clemency for his son. And I guess you could say that all of that drama that occurs in the intervening chapters sets the stage for what might be an odd lesson in Thanksgiving, which I think we can hopefully appreciate today. For David's monarchy, this was a tremendously important military victory. And yet, because David loved Absalom so much, the king's prolonged mourning and absolute emotional denial of the dirty politics which Absalom represented manages, in the midst of this victory, to rob the entire nation of a sense of accomplishment and a sense of relief. And so it is that we get this sad description from the writer of Samuel of the morale of the people who won back David's rightful monarchy. And it says this, quote, And the people stole into the city that day as people steal in who are ashamed when they flee in battle. You heard the word from the other translation talk about the stealth of the people. They actually came in quietly because they knew the king was in mourning. Well, it was a great victory nonetheless, and you can imagine how this action on the part of the people stung with respect to the commanders of Israel, and how this both baffled, and I would argue even angered, David's most trusted commander, Joab. But King David, even in the midst of his commanders coming through the gate, still did not relent. He was covering his face, he was repeating his mournful sobbing. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom. You know, you know, obviously it must have been quite a scene on some level. And on one level, of course, we can understand he's a grieving father. Even though his son was a rebel, his son was still his son. Absalom was arguably dad's favorite. Absalom was charming. Absalom was popular. Absalom was a specimen. You know, come to think about it, Absalom was a lot like Gaston in, in, in Disney's Beauty and the Beast. Shall I sing for you? I'm especially good at an insurrection. Oh, what a guy, Absalom. That's the kind of guy he was. But not surprisingly, Joab doesn't share a father's grief here. He sees the political situation as it actually is. He knows an illegitimate threat when he sees it. Absalom, after all, was an absolute rebel, a scheming usurper, a charmer among snakes, good-looking, but deadly. And to Joab, those that fought for David against Absalom's incursion are the real heroes and are the true servants of the rightful king. And so, amazingly, there comes a point, and it is actually amazing when you consider the history of Middle Eastern politics, where you can imagine what would be like here if Joab was Nebuchadnezzar's general. Would Joab get away with talking to Nebuchadnezzar like Joab gets away talking to King David? But of course, in the Judeo understanding, in the Jewish understanding and, and, and Old Testament understanding of monarchy, it did not mean that the monarch was beyond critique. And so, there comes a point when the four-star General Joab has had enough, and he came directly into the king's house, and he absolutely unloaded on him. The nation, after all, is at stake, and David doesn't have the luxury for such undiscerning remorse. And his commander says to David, You have today covered with shame the faces of all your servants who have this day saved your life and the lives of your sons and your daughters and the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines. And Joab doesn't end there either. He continues and argues that David has covered his servants in shame because you love those who hate you and hate those who love you. 
In other words, in his grief, the king is no longer even seeing clearly who his actual supporters and friends are. He isn't being objective at all. And his inaction and lack of gratitude risks the nation, and that's a problem. Joab even suspects that had he and his army died and Absalom be alive or were alive, King David would be happier, which is a terrible, terrible thing. And so he soberly counsel, counsels David that if he doesn't go out now and speak kindly, dare we say, show a bit of thanksgiving and honor to his servants and soldiers who risked their lives for him, that not a soul will remain with him the, by the following day. And by the standards of ancient monarchy, of ancient despotism, you could say, this is an absolutely stinging rebuke of David's lack of gratitude, lack of thanksgiving. Joab was clearly on fire, stirred in spirit, and he lit his king up. Well, to his eternal credit, I would argue, David listened. Ironically, if we just take a step aside for a second, it is left perhaps to Solomon, another of David's sons, in Ecclesiastes to name a rather unusual evil. And that evil is this, to be given all manner of blessings, to be given all manner of wealth, to be given all manner of success, but to fail to enjoy them or even appreciate them. Joab and his soldiers deserve, deserved a moment from the king where he could reflect on their success, their stunning success, and be thankful for it. To reflect on the fact that, that the counsel of the greatest counselor in all of Israel had been defeated. That the insider that David had left to, to, to get, grant him information had succeeded in foiling the timing of the attack. That the king and the kingdom had been saved that the king's exhausted army had had a chance to rest and prepare for battle, and that the generals had correctly divided their army and delivered a crushing victory over an illegitimate regime. The least that David could do, even in the emotional ambivalence of that moment, was to say thank you to those who had risked their lives for him. In the books of Samuel and Ecclesiastes both, both David and Solomon, as monarchs, could attest to the fact that we are not always responsible for our successes. In fact, many times we aren't. God, with the help of those who also love us, sometimes gives us victories that we couldn't even predict, that looked actually impossible just a few days prior. And for us to fail to perceive those victories and be grateful for them, is in some sense a spiritual disaster. This, according to Ecclesiastes 6.2, is described as a grievous evil that we should not actually have a moment where we recognize the success, the success that we've actually achieved and be grateful and thankful for it. Well, I don't think King David is necessarily the only person who's ever been indifferent towards those who love them. Maybe, as Joab said, hated those. Do we sometimes actually get the same way? Do we hate those who love us, or in David's case, even love those who have poured out nothing but contempt for us? When Jesus says, love your enemies, I don't suppose he means that we be unaware of their intent, unaware that they are actually our enemies, because after all, you have to know your enemy is an enemy in order to love them. At times, though, here, it seems King David was not only willfully oblivious to the lethal enemy that Absalom had become in his own household, but also cold and callous towards those who'd actually granted him a great victory, those who actually did love him. David couldn't be grateful to those really, who actually had saved him. 
for those whose deeds proved that they were his actual friends because he couldn't see his true enemy. You know, I suspect that we're all guilty of that at times. How many of us are as conscious as we should be of the ways in which we have been saved by God? I count myself among those who can point to moments in my life where I was saved by the hand of God and saved literally by the hands of friends. Do we spurn those who've saved us? Do we hate those who have loved us? And more to the point, I guess, do we hate the one who has loved us most? The one who died to save us? His efforts went much further than even the efforts of those who dug deep for King David. We can't repay. We need to acknowledge that. We can only give thanks. If you've got nothing to offer, like all of us do when it comes to God, we can only give thanks. We have nothing as recompense for our lives. We can only show our gratitude. That's why Thanksgiving is a good day. That's why actually time to actually express Thanksgiving is known in, in the, among the nations as well as among our own understandings of our faith. In 1957, the Canadian Parliament declared the second Monday of every October to be, quote, a day of general thanksgiving to Almighty God for the bountiful harvest with which Canada has been blessed, end quote. Well, it was a good year around here. I don't know where you're from, but it was a good year around here. The blackberries were dripping off the vines. The pumpkins were growing like crazy. The apple crops, the prairie wheat crops, other bounty within Canada and locally was excellent, very good. And thanks be to God for that. And thanks be to God for his son, Jesus Christ, who went to the wall for us, risking and losing his all for our personal gain. We ought to respond to him in humble gratitude, even when it's difficult to love him who first loved us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day for all that you have done for us, for the things that we take for granted, for the things that we are able by your grace to perceive. We pray that you'd open up our eyes to the ways in which we could afford to be more gracious, more thankful. And we give you thanks for Jesus Christ who himself has died for our gain. Help us, O oh Lord, to love you you who have first loved us and learned the lesson of King David via the hand of his commander, Joab. And we pray this in Jesus' name.